The recording for this meeting has begun. Hello and welcome to today's Ask the Experts on Strengthening National Policy Systems, Bridging the Disconnect Between the Evidence and Action for Food Security. This is a special event affiliated with AgriLink's Food Security Policy Month this June. My name is April Thompson. I'm the Knowledge Management Portfolio Manager here at the Knowledge Driven Agricultural Development Project, um, which oversees AgriLinks, among other knowledge sharing platforms. I'm excited to be facilitating today's discussion featuring Shurish Babu, a senior fellow at IFPRI, along with uh, Duncan Boten from Michigan State University. Before I introduce our featured guest experts, I, I'm just going to quickly go over how today's event will work. We've gotten a number of great questions already from uh, our registrants, which I'll be reading out to Shuresh along with a few questions of my own. We also encourage you to type in questions and comments in the chat box, as our online facilitators will be selecting questions from there to also post throughout the event, provided we've got time to get through it all. <laughs> this is a short format, so um, we will try to keep it to the half hour allotted. Um, so with that, I'd like to introduce our featured expert, Shuresh Baba a senior fellow and a program leader at the International Food Policy Research Institute in Washington, D.C. He's also a professor of agricultural economics at the University of Pretoria in South Africa. Previously a research economist at Cornell University, Suresh has published 20 books and monographs and over 90 peer-reviewed journal papers on food and agricultural policies in developing countries. He's currently engaged in research on strengthening agricultural policy, research, and extension institutions and strengthening the capacity of the policy and researchers and analysts in India, Myanmar, Bangladesh, Brazil, Malawi, and Nigeria. In fact, he just arrived from Malawi, I believe, last night. <laughs> um, also here to answer your questions in the chat box, we've got Duncan Bowden, who is a professor at Michigan Gate State University. Duncan directs the USAID Burma and Lyft funded food security policy project in collaboration with IFPRI. He has over 30 years professional experience on agricultural research and technology transfer for smallholder farmers, value chain development, policy analysis, and outreach to host country senior government decision makers, and capacity building of local staff. Duncan and Shuresh, welcome to AgriLinks and today's Ask the Expert. We're really happy to have you here. Um, so Shuresh, just to dive in um, to kind of a core question to our event today, which is why with so much research and analysis, is the policymaking process so seldom evidence-based? Uh, first of all, let me thank you, April and, and Julie, for organizing this session. It's an important topic that, uh, that people would want to have some answers because uh, researchers do research and publish in academic journals and, and many other ways. And then they wonder why uh, the research is not taken up by the policymakers. And, and some are taken up by the policymakers, particularly when they are relevant for the decision-making process. So that tells us something, that uh, if your research is relevant for policymaking, then there is a demand for it. Um, but if you conduct research that is not connected to the policymaking process, or does not provide evidence to the policymaking uh, system, then um, sometimes it is ignored because it's not the right time. Even with uh, a particular research that is addressing a problem that the policymaker uh, is facing, it may not be the right stage of the policy process. That's why we say we should understand the policy process. The research that we have been doing with uh, IFPRI colleagues, International Food Policy Research Institute and Michigan State and others, University of Pretoria, uh, uh, did uh, look into um, how can we understand the policy process itself so that the research that we conduct can be made um, relevant for policy making not only in, 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 in the whole policy reform process, but also at every stage of policy making process. Great. Um, so obviously, as you say, um, the research has to be relevant to be incorporated, but what are kind of some of the key constraints that policymakers face to incorporate evidence in decision making, assuming that the evidence they're being presented with is, is relevant? Uh, even if the uh, policy uh, research that we do is relevant for the policy making process, sometimes policymakers face several constraints. Well, first constraint is uh, research itself uh, gives you know uh, wide ranging uh, you know recommendations. Um, uh, research methods differ. 
the data set differs to address the same question. So the research uh, may not be really very specific in terms of the recommendation. That's one aspect of it. Then uh, who is producing this research and evidence? The credibility of the people who produce the research and, and, and evidence is important. Um, in some countries, policymakers want the local research community to produce this research. And, 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 and that is where the capacity constraint comes in. We do not have adequate human capacity or the institutional capacity to produce the local you know, uh, research through the local. And, and the external collaboration uh, with the people like um, us, if PRE or MSU or University of Pretoria helps in that process. But eventually, the credibility of the research as well as the capacity to produce local research that can be trusted by the policymakers is very important. And in addition to that, there is always the political economy issue of policy making. Even if the research is uh, relevant, even if it produces the evidence that shows that taking action one, two, three is going to improve the economy or improve the welfare of the people, uh, uh, there is hesitation in terms of making that uh, research useful for policy making because the research usually comes up with the first best solution. And research and policy makers are looking for not at all the time first best solution, but the second best or the third best. And sometimes we miss out on that process. And that's what we are finding out from, from our research on policy process. And um, in addition to that, there may be constraints in terms of who is losing, who is winning. Understanding that is important. And that helps the policy makers to see whether the evidence can be used in that particular point in time in the process where they are in the policy process. Great. Well, we had a question from a reg registrant that actually um, ties into something you were mentioning in terms of the, the trust in the, re in the research evidence itself, which can be a constraint. Um, and um, this person wanted to know if there are practices that can enhance policymaker confidence in research evidence, and can these help lead to more policy action changes? That's wonderful. I mean, um, in order to build the confidence of the policymakers on the research that we do, uh, it's not enough to publish the papers and, and write policy briefs and then send them, you know, so that it lands on the desk, you know. Um, it is important to connect with the policymakers as researchers or the people who produce evidence need to connect with the policy makers from the beginning of the policy process, right? And even when the problem is being talked about, even before the problem comes into the policy agenda. We need to communicate and, and gain the confidence of the policymakers. That requires a lot of work. It is not just to fly in and collect the data and analyze the data and send the report. It is how do you sit with the policymakers, develop trust in the beginning, and, and uh, show the credibility of your, your research in the past and how you have done that kind of research in other countries, and what do you bring to the table in terms of working in that particular country, in that particular context, in which they are facing the, the policy problem. And, and what also helps is to work collaboratively with the local researchers to build their credibility and their capacity so that when you are done with the research, which may be of global interest, but the in-country capacity that is built through the research program, in, in all our programs we do that, is helpful in terms of taking the research and applying in the local context so that they can be continuously advising the countries. And that sometimes uh, uh, is missing in large research programs because people don't have time to build local capacity. And that kind of research is, is uh, sometimes is not really taken seriously because it stays in the journal papers and, and publications and so on. So that, that's a great point in terms of the capacity building really needed to be able to uh, enhance the role of evidence in, in policy making. What, what are some of those capacities and how can they be incorporated and built at the, at the national level? Okay, some uh, examples of the capacities that we have been working on under the FSP uh, um, Innovation Lab uh, is to strengthen the national capacities for policy analysis. Say, for example, where uh, Duncan, my colleague, who is joining uh, from Myanmar, we have been working in, in Myanmar to build a national uh, capacity at, of the policy system as a whole. It in, uh, to be started with the, the Ministry of Agriculture, where we set up an agriculture policy unit and identified the key uh, policy analysts there in order to give them the exposure of various methods of policy analysis. That really helps when it comes for them to pick up the global results and convert that into you know, really usable information for policy making within the system. And it's not enough to strengthen the policy uh, capacity of the policy analyst. We need to look at the other actors and players in the policy 
process and policy system. For example, we have been working with the University of Pretoria to strengthen the capacity of the journalists in, in Malawi. Uh, what does it mean? The, uh, the, when you strengthen the capacity of the journalists to understand the issues related to food security, issues related to uh, climate, climate change and resilience and, and so on, they are able to report uh, based on the results that we have done and take that results and, and report that in a way uh, uh, that is easily uh, used by the policy making system. So you, you see these research results are assimilated in a very nice simple English in the newspaper. So it attracts the policy maker, parliamentarians and it can create the debate within the policy system. So not just policy analysts but also uh, other actors and players uh, in, the, in, in, the, in the policy system as well. But policy communication is an important aspect of making things happen through policy research. It is not just publishing papers, but how do you convert that into policy briefs, policy memos. Sometimes we need to train the local colleagues uh, and, and collaborators that we work with to produce policy memos and policy briefs. Now we are into the modern age of social media. How do you connect with uh, LinkedIn and Twitter and Instagram and how do you reach policy makers uh, to, to um, find what you have done in terms of using that research in that policy making process. But uh, having said that, it is still important that one on one communication, researchers meeting the policy makers, researchers meeting the key actors and players in the policy system and strengthening their capacity to understand the policy is fundamental for making policy impact on the ground. Great. Um, well, I, I wonder, you know, in terms of facilitating it, it, coordination, you know, you, I, you have a good point that, you know, across the system that isn't just the policymakers, it's journalists, et cetera, but in enacting one policy, you, you may need to really coordinate among multiple authorities to really be effective. Um, and any advice on how, how to go about that to, to sort of influence policy outcomes by, by sort of breaking down those silos? April, that's a, it's a great question because uh, several of the policy issues that we deal with doesn't uh, squarely fit in one sector. If I'll give an example. Uh, take, for example, we want to address the nutrition, malnutrition problem, right? Uh, whether it is overnutrition, undernutrition, micronutrient, malnutrition. We have been looking at the micronutrient policy process, for example, in, in Malawi and what has happened in the last 25 years and who are the key actors and players. Uh, who, have, who have contributed to to, and, and, uh, to to policy making in nutrition sector. Malawi just released its multi-sectoral uh, nutrition policy after several years of uh, under preparation. When we looked at that policy process, what we find is it's not just the Ministry of Health, which is now hosting the Ministry the De Department of Nutrition, uh, but other ministries such as agricultural sector, uh, water sector, sanit sanitation sector. They all have to come together in order to. Uh, uh, contribute to the nutrition goal. But when you have um, uh, one sector hosting nutrition as, as, as the subject matter, it becomes difficult for multi-sector coordination. So that is where understanding of who are the actors and players in the policy process, what authority they have, what convening power they have in terms of bringing the people together for open dialogue and discussion. How do we enhance that capacity of convening through providing or empowering certain departments becomes important. And sometimes we ignore that aspect of institutional architecture. We ignore the aspect of institutional building and we ignore the aspect of institutional coordination at the national level and what amount of research we do then becomes not, uh, not very effective in terms of making things happen on the ground because the coordination of the multi-sectoral challenges such as nutrition or climate change, for example, or resilience building, they are all multi-sectoral uh, issues. Now we are talking about food system change for uh, and, and building resilience of the food system. That's inherently multi-sectoral issue that involves production, it involves uh, trade, it involves uh, the drought management ministry or, or the unit and also food safety, value chains, they all have to come together in order to strengthen the resilience of the food system. But how are we going to bring that together? So now we have to move away from the single sector approach to problem solving for policy to a multi-sectoral approach. That requires not just doing research on multi-sectoral issues, but also strengthening the capacity for multi-sectoral leadership, strengthening the capacity for multi-sectoral understanding of the food system uh, in this case, for example, and, and building that capacity in the country level so that context-specific food system approach to resilience, for example, can be understood and, and made into uh, uh, research evidence for policy making. 
I'm going to put you on the spot here and see if you have an, an example of where you think this has been done well. Well, we are currently working. Duncan, uh, Professor Duncan Bowton is online. We have been working in, in, in Myanmar, for example, in the last three to four years, trying to bring the, the public sector, private sector, um, and also the NGO sector, which is, which is growing in Myanmar, uh, under the program called LIFT, uh, working with USAID colleagues there. And, and uh, we find that it is important that we bring these people together in order to even develop the agricultural strategy collectively so that they understand. Now, recently we have been looking at how the nutrition goals can be uh, achieved through transformation of the food system, which inherently brings uh, the health ministry, trade ministry, um, uh, health ministry, uh, and agriculture and food safety issues uh, into, into bearing. So we brought people together and uh, discussed about what are, what are the investment priorities when you look at the food system as a whole, not just the production aspect of it, not just the irrigation aspect of it, not just the market aspect, aspect of it. If you have to create an investment plan to address the multi-sectoral aspects of food system contribution to nutrition, how the investment plan should be different compared to the single sectoral investment plan. And how, who will contribute to that? Who are the actors and players will come and do the implementation once you have the strategy? And, and that's not been done in many countries. It's just the operational issues have not been looked at seriously. We worry about the problem solving in terms of research. Uh, to some extent, we want to strengthen the capacity. But really, how do you operationalize the concept like food system approach to resilience in our food systems approach to nutrition problem solving in the national level is something that we need to research on, and we are working on it under this program. Great, thanks. Well, I want to turn to another question from one of our registrants, which um, th this person was wondering about how long, on average, it takes to get policy reform through these various stages um, to full and effective implementation. Well, that's, that's an interesting question, April, because uh, some policies are made uh, by the stroke of a pen. Okay, so the Prime Minister wakes up one day and say, I, I see this problem and I need to solve this problem and all I can do is to just, you know, say that this, things have to change from today onwards. I mean, those are, those are the policies that happen overnight, right? And, and, and uh, some examples of uh, the macro policies such as exchange rate policies, uh, demonetization uh, kind of policies, solving the, uh, the black money in a country, for example, those are the policies people uh, really quickly make and they, 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 they uh, want to show the impact quickly on the ground, right? On the other hand, there are policies which are driven by the emergencies, such as drought and, and floods and, and so on. And these are the policies that we call food crisis-related policies, and, and they push the policymakers to make policies. In the kaleidoscope model of policy process that we have been studying, we, we also study what type of policy crisis or policy environment that pushes policymakers to make policies in different time frames, right? Mm -hmm. So there is this, this emergency-oriented policies, also short-term policies. I mean, there is this uh, short-term to medium-term policies, which are like fertilizer subsidies. You can change them year by year, but also you can slowly phase them out in two to three, four years time period. That requires a, a time period of two to five years, for example, if you have to work through that. Uh, there are long-term policies. Now we are talking about the SDGs. Mm -hmm. um, we are setting the goals for 2030, right? So 17 sustainable development goals. In order to achieve that, you need to have a long-term, you know, structural transformation of the economy. And policies related to that take time, transformation of the economy. And then, but then those long-term policies can also result in what do we do in the next five years in terms of agricultural sector change. And, and uh, to give an example that we worked in Nigeria, colleagues with Nigeria, is that uh, Nigeria had a previous government had a, a long-term economic transformation program. So as a derivative of that, what would the agriculture sector do? So we had an agricultural transformation uh, agenda, and we worked on, with, with USAID uh, funding and, and colleagues there, mission colleagues there, to identify the capacity needs for transformation of the agricultural sector. And then you work uh, down to see what are the investment needs in order to get to that level of capacity and so that transformation can take off in different value chains that you are working on. That's, a, that's an example of uh, a medium-term policy derived from a long-term policy uh, uh, and, and then and working on a day-to-day -day investment plans and, and actors and players uh, strengthening themselves to contribute to that. Great. Um, I want to turn to a question that just came in um, 
from one of our participants, uh, Chris Shepard Pratt, who um, wants to know what are a couple of the most common misconceptions about getting countries to adopt and implement evidence-based policy, or um, otherwise put, mistakes that stakeholders make in advocating for evidence-based policy change. Um, is there anything that sort of surprised you about the research that you've undertaken in this way? Well, it's a great question because, you know, researchers and, and uh, people who generate evidence in general, they assume that once you generate evidence and put it out there, somebody will pick it up and, and use it. That's, a, that's the largest, uh, to me, it's, it's a huge misconception about that, right? Uh, it's not going to be automatic, and you need to be um, consciously working within the country to see who are the actors and players who are interested in, in this policy reform, who are the opponents of the policy, who are the proponents of the policy, who are the policy champions, and how can we strengthen them if this policy, the evidence that we have is going to help them. Either way, uh, 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 whether to bring down a bad policy, right, and there may be opponents and champ policy champions may be working on that, or there may be a, a set of champions working on a positive policy to change uh, the policy and the positive. Both requires evidence and, and understanding the, not just the, who are the actors and players, but what are their capacities? How are they connected to policy making system? And we uh, um, uh, rarely do this kind of analysis as researchers. And that's why the research that we did under this uh, FSP program on kaleidoscope modeling of policy process really are, we, the case studies that we produced helped us to understand what are the capacity weaknesses of these people and how can we feed this information to them. The other misconception is that this local capacity is always there to translate what you do at the global level. It is, it is not, uh, uh, we assume that the capacity is there. Local institutions are, are just waiting for us to give the results to them, right? And, uh, and it's not happening uh, uh, because they, they are under, you know, policy process and whatever they have to do and they run around meetings and, and workshops and so on. Uh, and they don't even have some time to sit down and convert the research that you do into a policy memo mm -hmm. for the minister. So that's where we need to target uh, what we call strategic policy communication. Strengthen that communication skill uh, that is not there in the, in the local level in order to take the research that we, we, we do. The third misconception is that we, we, we are now into social media and, and we say, oh, uh, if he can tweet this and the minister there is going to get it. Uh, first of all, he is not, a fo he's not following you and probably he is not even on Twitter uh, or uh, Facebook or whatever social media you are using, right, or LinkedIn. Uh, but we need to identify what are the methods in which the policymakers are absorbing the information. It's not journal article for sure, okay. but what is a policy memo that we can write, policy blogs that we can write, and how do we get it to the table, and how do we get the attention of the policy uh, makers uh, for the research that you have done, so that the information that uh, that you have produced as evidence can get into the policy making process. Okay, so you've talked a little about capacity and communications and, and the importance of that. Um, but, um, what, um, and this is a, a question from um, someone in the audience here, um, what, what are some of the other capacities? Are you talking about technical capacity only? Are we talking administra administrative or financial capacity as well? Maybe you can kind of go into some of those core competencies that you see as important to, to translating this evidence. Into Wonderful. Uh, I, I think um, the higher education institutions in the developing countries that we are working with have a larger role to play in, in strengthening the policy system. And uh, we have not effectively used them, partly because uh, they don't themselves have the capacity uh, to, to connect to the policy makers. And sometimes the quality of research that they do uh, is not up to the mark, so the policy makers within their own countries do not take the policy researchers who do the research uh, in their own countries seriously. So, the, so you have the issue of not only increasing the quantity of policy analysts and researchers in the national system, but also strengthening their capacity to produce quality uh, outputs. So what are the incentives for them to produce quality output, and how, do, how are we going to recognize them for, for that? And that's by working jointly with them, collaboratively, to strengthen the capacity in the long run. Sometimes we see the capacity development as a short-term kind of effort solution, and it is not. It's a long-term 20-year, 30-year process in order to build a national system capacity for policy research and analysis, and that is converted into 
through their credibility into policy making. For example, uh, we don't go build capacity in Korea, Japan, and, and, and those countries which have already adequate capacity uh, uh, in terms of policy analysts and researchers. And, and why? Because they, the local researchers have the credibility to connect their research with the policy makers. So uh, in, 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 in some of the countries that we work with, the, the capacity is there, but they are not uh, connected to policy making system, mainly because they have not shown their credibility. And sometimes they run around, do consultancies, and the quality of consultancy is not enough uh, to take uh, uh, that as a serious policy material for evidence. So we need to bridge that gap in terms of bringing that, what capacity we have in terms of quality, how can we improve through collaboration. So collaborative research capacity building is a key component for long-term capacity impact as well as policy impact on the ground. So what happens when you have short-term administration changes and here you've been working to build a policy and then you have a regime change? What then? Absolutely. That's where the political economy issues come in, in understanding. We sometimes don't fully understand the political economy issues and the drivers of political economy that contributes to policy, policy making. And uh, uh, that also brings us to the issue of policy continuity or policy discontinuity. The, the more disruptions there are in terms of the, the political systems and the new government comes in and then ignores the old policies and comes up with a new policy, there is always going to be policy disruptions. But in order to understand these disruptions and expect those kind of dis dis uh, disruptions, we need to be prepared with, with policy research as well as analysis. It's not that you do the research after the fact that policy is introduced. That's some, it's important to evaluate the impact and learn from the, from the policy, but also it is important that we understand the, 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 the political economy of the policy making from different ideologies and different uh, set of policy um, players in the country as the, as the government changes. We need to anticipate and, and start producing the results from either from the past research and, and, and also are, are from the current research to guide the policy making process. So true, it is, it is important uh, that we recognize the policy, uh, political economy issues, but also the, the past research that we have done. For example, in famine research, we have been doing research on famine for several uh, decades now, and we have solid evidence of what works, what doesn't work in the relief programs. But now the recent effort is to convert that relief into resilience and resilience into long-term development. That requires, you know, understanding the political economy of how the, the various uh, governments, when they come in, treat the, the issues of uh, emergencies as well as the long-term development. Understanding that, we can provide the policy material, policy research uh, from the past research to guide the policy process. Okay, great. Um, we had a, a, another question come in, and I, I want to flag, too, that we're unfortunately running out of time, so we're going to move to our, our exit polls here. Um, while well, we kind of um, answer a few last questions. Um, so uh, Binyan Ayob had um, a couple of questions, one being your suggestions to enforce the implementation of existing policies and related metrics of success. Um, what su suggestions do you have for enforcement and metrics of success? And if you can give any specific examples. Very good question, right? Uh, it, implementation, as you will see in the kaleidoscope model that we have been researching on uh, using the model, is one of the stages of policy process. So, and, and a very little researched in terms of uh, uh, what happens to the process of implementation. And when you actually take the policy, policy is written in paper and it is there, and you see there is no results on the ground, mainly because sometimes because you have not followed it through the implementation process and in the implementation process, there are several weaknesses. For example, capacity is a major weakness. And what is the incentive for the people to take the policy that is on the paper, convert that into programs and, and projects, and support that with the uh, investment that is needed, the budget that is needed, and monitor who is doing what and how are they doing in terms of uh, attaining the goals that you set for yourselves in the, uh, through the strategy or the policy development is very critical. An example of that is the National Agricultural Investment Plans that we have been helping the countries to put in place. Mm -hmm. And that gives a clear roadmap on what are the things that we want to achieve, what are the indicators of the uh, policy goals that we want to achieve, and what are the stages of implementation in which these 
things can happen and who will do that. So these are the, the metrics that we need to uh, put in place through a, a, a roadmap like a National Agriculture Investment Plan under the CADAP, for example. Uh, and it has been very useful and effective in terms of tracing the implementation challenges. But overall, we have done less work on understanding the implementation process and, and, and the difficulties in that process and fixing that process uh, compared to the, the policy research and analysis itself. So more and more uh, as we move on to, to implementing policies, we need to kind of get our hands dirty in understanding the implementation challenges and what capacities are needed there and how we can uh, and improve the governance accountability in that process so that we can hold people accountable for what has happened through the policy change on the ground and, and what needs to be fixed in the implementation process. Sure, Shem, we're, we're at time. I'm going to ask you one last tough question okay. that came in um, from our right. guy, which is that government authorities tend to reject research-generated evidence that can be interpreted as indicators of their own failure. How do we deal with a problem like that? I, again, it, uh, it uh, relates to the political economy issue we talked about. Of course, if you point out uh, things have not worked, uh, the policymakers are not going to be happy because they are facing election next year or year after that. So uh, it is it's a tricky issue, uh, but evidence is evidence. Uh, researchers should seek the truth, and, uh, and you have to present uh, what you find out, uh, and maybe you can present it in a, in a, in a way, in a polite manner and, and not confrontational manner. But uh, researchers are out there to find the truth, and we can't uh, uh, mend the truth for the for the for uh, pleasing, uh, pleasing the policymakers, right? Even if there is an election coming up, uh, but the, but the, that is the, the the role of researchers to find the evidence, and uh, to the extent that we apply the right models, the right data, and 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 bring out the policy options and what has happened because of the policy change, what has not happened, is going to be useful uh, for the policymakers. May not be the person who is running for election, who is in the, in the position right now, power right now, but maybe for the next who comes to the power, for example, to take a look at it and say what went right, what went wrong, and why. Mm -hmm. uh, that is the fundamental objective of research uh, in terms of assessing the impact of whether it is, it is uh, pleasing to the policymakers or uh, politicians or not. We, as researchers, have to provide the evidence and seek the truth. I think that's a great place to stop. And um, unfortunately, we are out of time. But I really want to thank you for sharing all your wisdom on evidence-driven policymaking today um, and for the great engagement we've had online. Um, I want to uh, make a couple quick announcements here. Um, we do have um, another Ask the Experts um, this Thursday, June 28th, on food security policy in fragile states, uh, featuring Jeff Hill, who's the director of the Ec Office of Economic Growth and Agriculture in USAID, South Sudan. Um, that will be held at TAM EST. Uh, also, please join AgriLinks and continue the conversation on food security policy this June. And um, in July, also, we'll be talking about the enabling environment for agricultural market systems. So thank you, everyone, for tuning in. Thanks again, Suresh. Thanks, Duncan, thank also for, for the engagement online. And see you at the next one. Thank you.